life of an animator. Today I am Chris Dow, who has been in the industry for more than 15 years. He worked on both parts of animation, 2D and 3D. He recently finished projects like The Boys, Expanse and Trickster to name a few. Let's hear what Chris has to say about being an animator, what it takes to do to do good realistic animation in TV shows and movies. It's going to be a lot of information, so take a pen and paper and take some notes. Let's get started. I wanted to put uh, a couple pieces of concept art in the beginning. I don't consider myself a good concept artist, but I wanted to put this here to remind us that it's important to keep drawing and painting. Um, whether if even if you don't want paint, just keep drawing characters if you love character design. I find that in animation, the stronger your traditional skills are, the stronger your animation gets. And as a person who is traditionally trained in animation, um like stuff like life drawing is essential um if you never really get to a high level of drawing it's really hard to get strong posing and posing is really the backbone of animation so i put this in here just to show that i wanted to play with colors and composition and lighting and just uh and even on top of this, uh, drawing just keeps me inspired. So I find when I'm doing my best animation work, it's when I'm drawing the most. Now, when I, I also do a lot of previs work. So that's where I like people like Feng Zhu, who shows you really strong compositions. Keeping in mind that uh, if, if, if you keep doing digital painting, you improve your composition and your going to have better control of your camera you shouldn't um, when you do an animation you shouldn't really be just sticking your character in the center screen doing the animation of the character and then ignoring the camera it's fun to learn a little bit about editing too but uh, we'll go into the demo reel first and then we can talk about other stuff Equus, so i'll just play a little uh, bit have, and in this voice. demo reel this isn't a demo reel i would make for applying for a job this is a demo reel I specifically made for this talk because I think in animation especially, each demo reel should be made for its purpose. So for instance, if you're doing TV animation or you're applying for a TV job, you want to show that you could do a high frame rate per day and you could keep the quality at well. When you're doing a demo reel for a feature film job, you don't want to put any bad work in it. You only need like maybe three shots in a feature film demo reel. It doesn't have to be long and it's better to be short. So in a feature film demo reel, I would do like two acting shots with dialogue and then one shot to show that you could do some kind of body mechanic. So, um, Hey, Anything Chris, more? Uh, than that? Uh, I'm just gonna jump in. Um, I have a question because, like, you were showing the. Can you like go through the first painting you showed me? Yes. Yeah, because like when when I saw the painting, it looked really abstract and it looks like a bunch of scribbles. But when I look at it from far, you know, it looks realistic. So I really like your style of uh, concept thing. But like, like. Do you always like to paint like really loose or do you have something in mind yeah. or how did you paint it? No, I love painting loose. Mm -hmm. I think I got that from watching Feng Zhu. Um, what I'm sure he calls it, if he didn't, I've heard other people's call it, it's like the illusion of detail. So you don't have to make sure, like especially once you start drawing stuff in the background, you don't have to have it a specific object you're drawing. Sometimes these random colors that are fleshed out through how you do the lighting in that will kind of make up some kind of detail in the viewer's mind. It's 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 almost like when the viewer looks at it, it kind of makes a picture for them in their imagination. So for instance, if there's like a small stick in the background, you don't need to paint that. So when it gets messy in the background, that's great because it makes it feel like it's more detailed, even though it's messy. And in animation, it's really good to be messy when you first do your first pass if if you draw everything clean it all comes out stiff so having that illusion of detail in not only your painting but also in movement can help create a stronger piece that's at least in my opinion 
so far it's been good for me and it also makes me go through my work much faster if i sit there and i try and draw if it's traditional animation or 3d animation if i try and have every pose perfect then it's just going to be frustrating i'm going to be beating my head against the computer i'll probably get bored but if i go fast there's a lot more energy in my animation and also i notice there's more energy in the painting it keeps me more interested in what i'm working on as well so yeah illusion of detail is such a time saver and it's such an enhancement to the quality of your work so these stuff this is really old every show you can learn something different on sorry if i'm talking too much here but when i worked on tom and jerry you know it's sure it's flash animation it's not the most highest quality we're stuck to our budget but one thing you could look at like when you go through frame by frame you could really ask yourself how many frames can i take to get this character in what's it look like in in the breakdown or the in-between you really get to play with different types of timing and if you only do one style of show you're kind of you're kind of hurting yourself as an animator as an animator you want to be able to like look how look how different these frames are the reason why this works as an animation is because when you're seeing i don't remember this i think this is jerry when you're seeing jerry go a million miles an hour in one frame really all you're seeing is the color you don't even really see the face you don't have enough time to read it you your eye connects uh the different shades of color to where it is before to where it settles and then you hold in that pose to where it settles and you do like a slight movement just to show a little dissipation of energy you don't even need to do that technically in tom and jerry it's pushed so far but it just goes to show you how far you could push a piece of timing Realistic animation, you don't get to do that nearly as much. I'm sure there are situations where it can happen, but you can completely break an animation in betweens, which is the beautiful part of it. Sometimes you could have in 3D animation an arm that's 10 feet long, but you can't see it because it's foreshortened towards the camera. So stuff like this, uh, in flash animation you'll get like pre-made uh cells so like a lot of these are pre-designed by character designers and as an animator you're uh, just giving it the motion but sometimes you have like a cape and that has to be hand drawn because it's just that the quality is not there for whoever is doing the asset or they can't predict how that cape is going to flow in the wind so all this cape movement, that will just be going in and you just hand draw it yourself. Which kind of makes it feel great because it feels more traditional as an animator. Because now you got to think of the acting. When you get a detailed storyboard, like I got for Puppy Dog Pals, it really gives you the information you need to not to get right in and start animating. So a strong storyboard is very important, in my opinion. But yeah, it's like... An, it's like Posing is like taking that storyboard to the next level, uh, fixing and in improving on the posing, hopefully. And um, it allows you to look back at your shot and uh, see it at an early stage to make the choices and decisions you want to make. All right. Thanks, Chris. Here we go, puppy dog pals. So. I can't remember if there was a stock walk I used. Probably the first part where these puppy dogs come in, but you usually take the stock walks. And I know I did the zigzag and stuff on these characters. So what I would have did is I would have taken a stock walk that the lead did on this show, and then I would have customized it for what I needed. One thing you want to keep in mind when you're animating characters, uh, whether it's in VFX or in uh, fully animated 2D, 3D stuff, is you want to keep them connected to the environment. When they 
don't feel connected to the environment. It's almost like you have a drawing that's just kind of copied and pasted over top of something. A very quick and easy way to keep your characters connected to the environment is eye contact and eye direction. It doesn't take long to do. I wanted to show this one because in animation, you don't always have to be having your character or whatever it is you're animating moving around all the time. Uh, a lot of times, it's nice to stick into a pose and animate within the pose. And you'll hear traditional animators talking about this a lot, especially the old school ones. They'll say, you want to find that key pose and then work inside that key pose. In traditional animation, too, uh, one of the lessons I was taught was never let your character go dead. Basically, in the old Hanna-Barbera stuff, if there's like a held cell, the character dies pretty quick in traditional animation. 3D, I find it doesn't die nearly as quick. And with this cat in the background, sometimes it adds comedic value to break that rule and just have the cat completely still. <sighs> Hey Chris, so for this show, like you did just animation, or you also did like kind of work for previous? For this show, this was just animation. Uh, how this studio did the show was they had a layout team and a layout supervisor, and they worked from brilliant boards that were done by some guy hired by Disney, and they matched those boards as closely good. And obviously, there's no camera movement in storyboards, so you got to take it like a previs person would and you got to make sure that the camera is moving in in a beautiful manner you know so when we were given these shots this was all set up for us for the most part sometimes i had to add in a lot of assets myself but uh like when they're toys and need to get added in but for the most part when we were given these shots we were said you're not allowed touching the camera which is fine, because that's less work for me to do. I get to because the deadlines are so tight with TV shows. You don't want to have to sit there and mess with the camera. You just want to spend all that time on your animation, and especially when you're not insanely fast at animating, you will have to get to a point where you just have to let a shot go. You say, "This is the time I got for the shot. This is all the budget." And the production time allows the scheduled for it, and it's time to move on. My grandmother was a painter, and she said basically the same thing. She used to spend about a month on each painting, and she said, you could spend forever on a painting, but sometimes you just have to let it go and <laughs> move on to the next project. So this shot here, this is something I did in the show a lot. Basically, I consider there's three main points of acting in a character. I don't know if I got this from someone or if this is a rule I made up myself, but I consider there's acting on the body, acting on the face, and acting on the hands. And when you're drawing, especially uh, traditional animation, I wish I saw more of it in 3D, some of the good at 3D animators do it, is they always use a line of action in the body. It's mostly either a C curve or an S curve. And one thing I loved doing with these characters is I would push the face to have that C curve or S curve too. So you could do a, like a big squash in here, right? Everything coming in, the eyes are squashing in, the mouth is squashing in, and then at the same time, or you could vary the timing a bit, it's up to you, I go off and draw like a C curve to the left here with the face. If I left it straight up and down, it's like drawing a character in a T pose. Your character will be drawn straight up and down. It's always nice to have that bit of a slant in there. I don't know why, but this is just, I guess, the appeal principle. I'm trying to keep that a little bit of a slant. You could even have that slant carry through the body. This is 
basically just reacting. Instead of having the character stand still, talking, I have him reacting to the balls that are being thrown up at him. Sometimes it's fun to push the timing. Obviously, you can't jump like this and pause in the air in real life for those frames. But it's a cartoon, so have some fun with it. This is supposed to be a fun show. You know, why don't... Basically, when I did this, I was like, let's just exaggerate that fall. Instead of having it realistic, let's hold them up a bit and then drop them down. One thing you'll notice with this shot is one dog is the the darker colored dog he's uh, the older brother and he's more mature and probably a little bit more aware the other dog um is a little bit more of a space cadet and a lot more clumsy and a lot more brute force type dog so when i had the older dog come with the stairs he comes up a little bit more careful in control and dainty <laughs> So you can see, like, the paws just kind of like going do, 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 up. He's avoiding all the toys. And then I have the brute force dog just kind of go blah, power through and start just knocking everything over as he comes up. And as you can see, that carries through. He rolls over his butt. <laughs> and knocks him off. I could play this back at real speed for you, just so you get an idea of it. Kind of butchering my demo reel by going frame by frame, but I think going frame by frame is a great way to look at animation. So, like I said, C curves, S curves, going in here. Switching C curve from side to side, C curve, C curve. So this is about taking the voice acting that he's doing. He's got a piece of dog he's got to deliver. And instead of having him do pose, stop, pose, stop, and then hit, it's always good. Like if you really want to take your animation to the next level, try bleeding actions together. So he's talking, 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 still finishing the sentence. As he's finishing the sentence, I have him hit his um, exaggeration point and start moving into the anticipation of hitting the ball. And I try and keep the acting in his face flowing through like it's all planned out in his mind. Doesn't have to stop, move, stop, move. So now we're going to go into VFX stuff. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are more interested in animation of fully animated stuff or VFX, but I kind of like them both for different reasons. Uh, this is from a show called Killjoys. Basically, uh, this show was a lot of learning for me. This was fairly early in my VFX career. Most of my career at this point was traditional animation, I did one show, well, one and a half shows that was 3D, and then into VFX. And this is really what was teaching me to work with plates, which I find like I'm finally starting to understand now. <laughs> so this is really taking principles of animation and bringing it over into live action, which is great. So. This is uh, an alien squid creature. A lot of the principles that I use in this uh, tentacle is basically wave principle with overlapping action and follow through. This, the fun thing about this is when you get this shot, it's basically something they shot on set and they have this stunt actor in the background attached to a wire and they yank him backwards. So you have your timing already that you need to work with. So now you take your animation and you make your animation look like it's pulling the guy and not the wire. His reaction is already there. You're making sure your action makes 
his reaction look like it's working? And stuff like this is nice because it shows you don't always have to do something complicated and zany. Uh, a lot of times it's uncalled for and it's distracting. It breaks the illusion of the of the story that everyone's in. You like like making when you're making your camera moves, and when you're an editor and you're doing your cuts, or when you're an animator and you're doing your animation. Anything that pops out in your face. Uh, that that looks like a cut if a cut looks like a cut if an animation looks like an animation or if a camera move is really rough and looks like a camera move it pulls the audience out of the story and they go oh i'm watching a movie or oh this is cg so you're better off trying to blend it in and hide it and sneak it so it doesn't feel like it's animated so doing s animations that are softer not only sometimes like it's some people would frown upon it, but it's actually better because it works with what the point of the shot is. This shot was, um, I did so many versions of this shot. I remember when I was working on this shot here, this missile coming out. My animation supervisor drove me nuts. He was like, make it smoother, make it smoother, make it smoother. It's like, it is smooth. <laughs> he kept on pushing me to make it smoother and smoother. And finally, when it was finished, I was like, wow, this is good. And I never would have reached uh, this level of smoothness if it wasn't for him telling me to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. So this this one was really a lesson for me to keep my ego in check and go, yeah, you know, he's, he's seeing something here. And it was really beautiful because once the shot was done, it's like, you know, he was right. You know, it, it needed to be that smooth. This was another example of that. Same with the supervisor for here. Um, he really wanted to get this. So basically the blue light is like a main engine and the main engine cuts off and this, this uh, attitude thrusters turn on. So basically as soon as the main engine cuts off, it's got to drop quicker. And then when those thrusters turn on, uh, he wanted it to make it feel like it was catching itself. A lot of this was easy and hard because it's easy because it's not like a big character but it's hard because you really got to be precise in your timing for something like this and of course i did the camera work as well for this since it's a full cg shot and i had to make sure the timing of the camera coming down and falling with the ship was working as well yeah chris uh, i have a question so while you're working on the timing, so the thruster kind of like uh, exhausts the you know, smoke out, right? So you did the camera and the animation first, then they did the FX on it, or they did the FX first, then they give the pass and you have to work on the timing? No, so how it works with how this was rigged is those thrusters you see, uh, I actually have control in that uh, on the rig when I'm doing the previs. And when FX gets it, they use the keys for the timing that I put in it. So effects has the animation timing there, but they have to make sure that the effects are looking good visually. So they, it's automatically uh, in their Houdini file of when it turns on and off, but it's about them now at this point making how hard does the smoke push out? How thick is the smoke? You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not an effects artist, but basically I'm sure a lot of it, like, like one thing as an art director I could say is maybe the smoke isn't pushing out far enough. Let's have those smoke push out like uh, three times the distance or something, you know? So this is something that effects would go with. And also when you, I was going to say this a little bit later, but I'll say it now is when you're animating this, if I was to cheat this, like, cause sometimes when I do previs, I will have the ship not move 
and the camera move. And because it's in space and the ship isn't moving and the camera's moving and it's just those two things that you're identifying with, you can make it look like the ship is flying past you, when in reality it's the camera flying past the ship. But if you do that in a shot like this, the, the effects artist can't use the physics nodes inside their software properly because that smoke wouldn't be falling behind the ship now. The smoke would just be kind of floating around. So they would have to cheat it because you cheated it. So when you're doing something for effects, that's really effects heavy like this, you really have to take in consideration the other departments taking your work. This one is a full CG shot. And when you want to add a little bit of energy to a shot, but you're not allowed to move in the ship, uh, a great thing to do is to get that energy by doing uh, a little bit more movement in the camera. So as you can see, it, the camera just doesn't lock on and follow it. There's a little bit of a handheld feel inside the camera. This was an interesting shot because I did Technically, this one was more real pre-vis than what we do. Mostly what we do is technically post-vis and sometimes tech-vis, but this is what real pre-vis, and maybe they'll call it tech-vis too, uh, was for the shot. Basically, when I got handed the shot, we had a, a LiDAR scan of the set. So basically, a LiDAR scan scans the whole set and recreates it in 3D. And we take that 3D LiDAR scan and we put it in and then we create our previs inside that. We move, we do the animation, we do the camera work, and we go, we think this is how it should look. And they haven't shot this yet. And what we do is we send them files. We, one file would be, this is how we think it should look. And another file would be a diagram showing them how to place cameras and where to place them and, and what kind of lens to use. So when they go to shoot this on set, they have a lot of information available for them, so they're prepared for it. And you'll see companies doing this type of previs uh, a lot for very complicated shots. So if a, a shot, because complicated shots get expensive. So hiring and paying some people to do previs work will take a lot of the guesswork out them. And it also allows them to see or foresee some problems coming their way when they're about to shoot this stuff. All these boxes were hand animated. This wasn't effects, this was me. There was probably like a couple hundred boxes in here. And they used a, a little chunk of it, but basically this, I can't remember if this is full CG or not. I really can't remember if this is full CG or plate, but there's a hole in the side of the ship and I animated every single one of those boxes moving around. The bigger boxes were moving more slow and bouncing off each other. And every time those smaller boxes hit something or bounce into something, they had to bounce off and react to it. And then lighting had to go around and adjust it. I actually think this might have been a plate with... Uh, uh, Chris, it with... is a plate. Yeah, it is a plate. And uh, the, C the boxes are uh, beneath it are uh, the CG. So the light was going on and off in this, if I could remember correctly, it was a while ago. And there was even some red lights. And the lighting artist had to go in and match the lighting on set that's blinking off and on and add in the different colors. It must have been, um, must have been a nightmare. Uh, Chris, sorry yep. for interrupting. This is Ravi. Um, Hi. Yeah. Hey, how are you, man? Good, how you been? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, you're talking about the plate. Can you explain what is plate? Uh, what, do you, what is plate? So a plate is anything that's shot uh, from the production crew shooting on set. So plate is basically footage from cameras. So uh, what, what they do... Yeah, yeah. So, so basically they send us a plate and then we add the CG to it. Okay. There's, um, if you want to know more about plates, um, you'll have to get Nitty in here to talk about it. <laughs> She's the expert. <laughs> this shot here, um, basically, everything in this shot except 
the face is CG. So this body is CG, and the canister is CG. I think maybe the set might be real. I can't remember. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the set might be in, in the interior in the back. But what I did as an animator here is I lined up the body of this character to match the plate on the face. And the plate is being used for like, the first few frames. They cut out a few frames in it, but basically this is plate. And as soon as it goes to blur, it's now full CG. So everything right here, this is uh, the character's full CG face is uh, plate. Now we're getting into a full CG face, full CG character. And then I animate the character coming out and tossing, and turning through the space. This is going for more of a realistic style. Animation, not as cartoony as the last, but uh, what I was going for was to make people thinking that this is a real character. I didn't want them to think it was animation. This shot was probably one of the first uh, double shots, like the CG doubles that we got. And they've been going so well that the client has been giving our studio more and more of these. So that's great. It's always nice to know that, uh, especially when you're like you're the lone animator in a studio, it's nice to not only build up your own demo reel, but it's good to build up the studio's demo reel. So they're able to get nicer and bigger work, uh, bigger, um, what's it called? Having a brain for here, but basically, the the better their demo reel gets, the, the cooler shots you get. This one is uh, just a very simple animation. Uh, sh she's in zero G jumping out. I just wanted it to be simple, believable. The person in the background is actually uh, footage from a plate, so I didn't animate that. It's the person in the foreground. Uh, it's nice to get these filler shots. It's very hard to shoot wire work that makes it look believable in space. So I'm thinking double work is the way to go for that. This is from the show The Expanse. Um, the Rossi never landed in atmosphere before. This ship is called a Rossi. And this is like the first time it's come down the atmosphere. So I wanted it to be epic. And I thought the best way to do that was to make it feel like you're a skydiver falling down with the ship. So when I was doing the previs in animation for this, which is the camera work and the framing and the ship animation, I really wanted to make it feel like I was falling with the ship. Also, at the same time, this is a new paint job for the ship at this point. So I wanted to show off the work that assets did. When I get, uh, sometimes I'll get assets and I'll look at them and I can see that the asset artist put a certain amount of attention into specific things. And whenever I see that, I try and show it off. For instance, there was one shot where I had a whole bunch of debris, a debris which is just space junk that was floating around. But there was one piece of debris that was a little bit more special. And I took that debris and I shut it off and I put it on camera. And then when I set up the lights for it in previs, I wanted the light to hit it so it could read. This is just a, a simple sh animation. It's really just like uh, linear animations with a timing change. Uh, some, this is just an example of animations don't need to be over top. It doesn't need to be flying and zooming through the shot. This is a realistic show going for more serious type of feel. So just having it simply come in and slow down is basically the best approach for the shot. This shot here, uh, I remember looking at the concept art for this shot and just loving it. The composition was great. So when I put this shot together in previs, I set up 
the the land in a way, which has been improved by assets since me. Basically, I did basic cubes in the land, and then I framed the shot to match the concept art. So somewhere out there, there's a concept artist going, hey, they animated my painting, which turned out great because it's just the composition was beautiful. And I find these types of compositions work best with a, a wide lens. This is uh, the show bases itself on realism a lot, but sometimes you want to fake the camera. And I'm pretty sure this shot, I faked the stars. So what I would have did is, in real life, if you're focusing a camera at this at a spaceship, it doesn't it doesn't really matter how fast that spaceship is going. Those stars aren't going to be zooming by. Those stars are so far away. There's they're, they're going to be almost still, not moving at all, right? So what I did was I did two cameras. I did one camera for all of the CG stuff in, in the previous file. And then I did another camera in the same previous file. And I had it spinning in circles really fast at the same angle of this ship moving. So I used the one camera for the renders. And I used one camera for the stars. And that is what the client was looking for because they really wanted to make it feel like it was going fast. This is supposed to be a racing ship. This is the first time we're seeing it and the client said it's got to feel like it's going quick. Also, this show in the way its style is, you don't want unrealistic movements. The ship's not allowed to bounce around with a staggered animation. So what I do is instead of having the ship bounce around, you see I have the render camera bouncing up and down. So the render camera's got staggered movement. I'm allowed to do that to the camera. I'm not allowed doing that to the ship. And this one was cool. Um, I didn't put the whole sequence in here. It was like 21, 22 shots. Uh, this was like a season three, episode four. And our animation uh, VFX guy, or producer as well said you know i was allowed to do the storyboards for it and i actually got the i did probably about 90 percent of the boards for it and then we fleshed it out even more in previs so it was it was really fun this is like one of the first times our studios got to do like a 20 shot back to back in vfx i find the shots are separated by by like fully live action plates so you don't get to have too many full cg shots connected but this is one of the moments where we got to have that, which means you really want to get a storyboard in there because it makes your life a lot easier. The shot was kind of fun. Um, basically, this is an FK rig system. And what was given to me was uh, a neck track. So there's a piece of geo around the neck. You won't see it but lighting would have used it, and I used it. And that geo was tracked to follow this guy's neck movement exactly as it is in the plate. And I took this these bolas, and I animated them to wrap around that geo. And I had to really focus on, because it wasn't like a, an easy rig to animate, I really had to focus on keyframes. So basically, I said each keyframe was, this is exactly where I needed to be and how it was wrapping. And also another thing I had to really focus on when the shot was overlapping. I had to make sure that the geo wasn't, of the chains weren't penetrating each other as they're going around the neck. And another way is, the thing I had to worry about was when these shots were made, I think there was one shot that had a real bola that we had to match in assets. The way these shots were made was uh, these, these bolas were spinning around for a long time. So I had to find a timing and animation that made it feel like when we cut to the next shot, the, these bolas were still a certain length away from them, which wasn't easy. It definitely was a, a challenge, but I think it came out nice. It feels believable, I think. I think people are going to think they got hit by real bolas. This is just a bit of creature I did on Killjoys. 
I looked up a lot of references of real spiders running, and what I learned was spiders really are pretty careless of how they run. There's no real beautiful system with their legs. Sometimes they're even dragging legs. So what I did is I kind of did a more cleaned up version that we would probably believe as a human. If we imagined a spider walking, I went for something more like that, which the VFX industry already does for explosions. When a grenade goes off, they usually do like a lots of fire and stuff, but you don't really see that in real life. This shot here was one of my first big uh, animation shots in the effects industry. And it really taught me to communicate with uh, the comp artist in the lighter because it was really uh, a tough job for all of us to try and get this character, this spider, uh, at its size, because it's no small spider, to come out without penetrating the plate or having some kind of weird issue in lighting. So this was hard. This was like a lot of back and forth between animation, comp, and lighting. This, uh, the lighting artist who did this, she was amazing. My goodness. This is a CG Raven. And the work that came out for this uh, show was pretty good on the Raven. Like, uh, it was beautiful. These, this Raven was a... So penetrating the plate, um, basically, if this spider was rendered too far to the right or the left, when you look at it from the audience, it's going to look like the spider has some kind of weird connection issue going through the mouth. It'll be like some parts of it are just, they're, they'll be layered wrong. You know, they'll, they'll be like floating. It's going to be a nightmare for comp and it'll look like it's probably floating over top or, or something's cutting through the cheek. So really, um, this is, this is CG over a plate. So you have to have your CG render over top of the plate. The plate's got to be in the back. So everything that's going in behind the plate that we can't see that's coming out, like the body that's under the bottom part of the mouth that we can't see, that's all got to be rotoed out in comp. This... Uh, it was my girlfriend, I think, who actually did the tracking for the head for this raven. And tracking, there was a real raven on set. Even though this is full CG, they actually filmed the real raven as reference, which was great for us. And she tracked the head movement of it, which is basically taking the exact movement of the head of the raven. And I thought that it worked so well. Why should I change it? If it's working, don't break it, right? So I animated the body to work with the head movement that we had going here. That head movement is actually tracked from a real raven. This shot, um, when I was working on this shot, I really was going for trying to make it float with the camera. Uh, the camera is not moving very fast. This little glitch here is just something that they did in in uh, in post past us. So basically, the people who did the marketing did that. It's a lot smoother in the show. But uh, what I was focusing on was I just wanted to feel like it was floating around the same pace as the camera. This camera has been tracked for us, so it made that easier. And what I really wanted to focus on with the animation was I wanted to make it feel like the bird, at least on the wings, was reacting to kind of... Uh, air and wind flow. I didn't want it to be like perfect. I wanted the, the wings to kind of have its ebbs and flows up and down with air currents and wind. When you do a shot like this as an animator, the first thing you want to do is get your path of action. This is basically a line where the, main, the middle of the main body is going to go. You just have the whole bird, not even animated, it's just like a T-pose going through and you just you work that path of action in with the bird just in like a in a very stiff T pose, and you go, okay, yeah, you, you know, I, I like this path, which for me was like from screen left to screen 
right? And then into the background. The show was uh, the boys. And basically what I was told, it was lots of studios were offered to do this cut sequence, but they were all failing at it. Basically, they didn't have too much time to do it. And this was a big challenge for the effects artist at the time, which was Kevin and myself as the animator. And basically, it was, once again, communication is important here. Uh, we were back and forth with each other all the time. What you do is you have this plate that's shot footage of the actor. And then as soon as the actor turns, uh, like it's cut up, you can't cut up the actor in real life. So as soon as he's supposed to be something that he's not in real life, that's when you turn it to a CG plate. So it was a lot of back and forth about Kevin saying, let's let's do that here in this frame. And me going, yeah, let's do that here in this frame. And what I did is I animated, basically all these characters are animated twice. I did one for the upper body and one for the lower body. I don't know if you guys seen the show. I left out Boys Season 2 stuff because I didn't want to do any spoilers in case you haven't seen it. So... Uh, it's probably this is probably a plate, and then this would be the start of CG. And there's going to be two animations I give our effects guy. So there's one f animation that's a full body, not cut, with the legs and everything for the upper half, and then there's one for the full body with the upper torso for the lower half. And what the effects guy does is he he uh, basically he cuts it. <laughs> He does the brunt of the work cutting it. So this one, two characters, that means there's eight animations. One for each half, right? For one of these shots, I think we might have kept the plate for the lower body. I don't remember if we did or not. I think we might have kept the plate. And I don't remember what we did with the arm. I'm sorry. I think I might have animated it or the effects guy did. I can't remember. It's all a blur. <laughs> this was this was a time where we had to <laughs> move fast. I definitely remember doing those legs a hundred times. These legs, like I got notes. Have them land here, have them land there, have them land over there, have them land over there. So there was definitely a lot of iterations of going for legs. So the upper body is all plate. These legs are CG. This one started off with like both CG and then went to like an upper body plate, lower body CG, but then they wanted their upper body to fall further away. So I think we ended up with it both being CG. I remember someone making the comment that it would be funny if he got cut and the legs kept running. And I really wanted to do that. But uh, this, when I was working on this, uh, when I got given these shots, I didn't even know how the show style was going to be. I wasn't. I knew it was supposed to be funny. I didn't know if it was supposed to follow realistic physics or not. And with some of the notes I was getting, I thought maybe it was supposed to be a little bit more cartoony. But now I know what the show is, you know, after finishing the first season, I realized, okay, yeah, it, it's serious. Like the animation is supposed to be real life physics. It's not supposed to be cartoony, but it's supposed to be funny. This shot here, basically I had a lot of these shots, especially when I was new in the VFX industry at the company here. Uh, a lot of the shots I had was Basically, you have space with nothing in it. You have one ship and you have one camera. Okay, make it interesting. So every shot has to feel different and interesting, and you're always trying to find how to move that camera in that spaceship with nothing else around it to compare for speed or use nothing else for framing. And how do you make that shot look like uh, it's something... Uh, you know, that the audience would want to watch instead of seeing the same ship go by a hundred times.
this one is basically just the uh, kind of someone had an idea of trying to do the, like a silhouette where it's going through the sun, but uh, I guess it never really got pushed that far. But oh, I thought it was interesting. It, I I still see it a bit. It's nice. The shot here was make it look like uh, make it look like the Millennium Falcon coming out of the explosion there in Star Wars. Where it does the spin and rotate away. This shot here, uh, this is the end of the demo reel here, but this shot was basically the point of this shot is uh, coming up to this broken ship and there's a name on front of it. So we got to reveal to the audience what the ship is going to be. So when you do previs and even animation, it's all about telling a story. So I'm using this broken ship in the foreground to hide the two ships coming over it. So the two ships get revealed through their animation plus the camera move. And then we have the light go across the name so the audience could read the name of the ship. So it's like two reveals. It's one reveal of these two ships coming from behind it. And then using the light, we now reveal the name of the ship that's in the foreground. Yeah, that's my uh, demo reel I put together for you guys. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, sorry, it's, it's OJ, Chris. Uh, Chris, about a third of the way through your demo reel, you had the, uh, I think it was the uh, astronauts, and you said it was uh, doubles. Were you talking about uh, two plates? Uh, no, so we call doubles, uh, like we'll call them CG doubles. They're basically when we're doing uh, human characters. Yeah. So basically uh, what we call a double is sometimes it starts off as a, a CG character, or sometimes, a, sorry, starts off as a character from a plate and turns into full CG. And sometimes uh, it's just a face like this one that starts off from the plate and turns into full CG. And sometimes they're just full CG the whole way through. But that's pretty much what I mean by doubles. It's oh, just okay. a human hu human character. Okay. But cool. uh, Thanks. this whole, like if you actually watch the sequence in the shot, uh, it's, I think it's two or three plates stitched together by our layout uh the person who's layout for which was our supervisor and it was pretty impressive so basically you start off looking at a plate in the left once you get out here this is full cg now and because it's full cg cut out and in my demo reel it actually rotates back to what we were just looking at and goes into a second plate that was shot separately from the first one mm. so there's some neat tricks where you could use full cg backgrounds to go and hook plates up like that was very impressive. Cool. So the plate there was just for her face, and the rest was well. You had so, a background plate, and then you had a plate for the yeah, face. Yeah. So there's a plate for the interior. The exterior yeah. of the ship is CG. Uh, yeah. In the beginning, the face is a plate. So this is sh uh, her face shot on set. And then once it goes blurry, this is now full CG. So that okay. blur is basically a CG render that's been blurred. So the body was already double by then. There was, uh, we didn't use any of her body for this. We just started off full CG for the body. But I have worked on yeah. shots where we start off with the actual plate for the body, and then that goes full CG at some point, which was technically what we we're looking at for the boys stuff. That started yeah, off that's... as full, full plate going to full CG. Okay. Which is cool. hard. I could imagine. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.